Roller coasters provide you with sensations you can't normally feel. There aren't many opportunities to safely plummet towards the ground, reach stupidly high speeds, or experience total weightlessness. Roller coasters can take some of these sensations to the extreme. King Dakar plummets you 127 meters, 418 feet towards the ground, while Formula Rossa accelerates you to the top speed of 240 kilometers per hour, 149 miles per hour. But how much of this can the human body actually handle? Is there a roller coaster out there that's too much for even the bravest thrill seeker? Put simply, no. Roller coasters are designed to be enjoyable, though some would perhaps disagree. Your body can only tolerate so much before it becomes uncomfortable. Therefore, roller coasters have to adhere to strict standards which limit how intense they can be. These limits are measured in G-force. Theme parks often tout their rides as having many Gs of force, like Skyrush, which, according to Hershey Park, subjects you to up to 5 Gs. Cool. But what does that mean? G-force, short for gravitational force, is a measurement of acceleration, not force, so not really the best name. You, wherever you are currently, are experiencing the force of gravity, which pulls things towards the center of the Earth. If you drop an object, gravity will cause it to accelerate towards the ground at a rate of roughly 9.81 meters per second squared, which usefully corresponds to 1 g-force, or 1 g for short. Therefore, a roller coaster which boasts a maximum of 5 g's, 5 g-force, causes you to feel 5 times the effect of gravity. In most cases, this means that you'll feel like you're being pushed into your seat 5 times harder than if the ride wasn't moving. This sensation makes you feel heavier, almost as if a new, additional weight pins you down. The g-forces you experience on a roller coaster can be broken down into six key directions. Forwards and backwards, known as linear or longitudinal acceleration, denoted by the x-axis. Left and right, known as lateral acceleration, denoted by the y-axis. And upwards and downwards, known as vertical acceleration, denoted by the z-axis. It's this final direction that we most commonly associate with roller coasters. To make things even more confusing, the g-force being applied to your body is opposite in direction to the acceleration you feel. This is because your body has inertia, essentially meaning it doesn't want to move. When a roller coaster launches, the entire train accelerates forwards. Your body doesn't want to accelerate, but is forced to, causing you to be pushed back into your seat as the seat pushes you forwards. With that in mind, let's explore the six directions of force. At the bottom of a large hill, you'll experience what is commonly referred to as positive g-forces, which act in the upwards direction. These forces give you the sensation of being pushed downwards into your seat, causing you to feel heavy. The opposite occurs while climbing over the top of a hill at speed. You'll feel as if you're being pulled upwards out of your seat, causing you to experience weightlessness. These types of Gs are commonly referred to as negative G-forces and act in the downwards direction. Linear or longitudinal G-forces accelerate or decelerate a roller coaster's train. On a launch coaster, you'll be pushed back into your seat while the train accelerates forwards. The opposite occurs when you hit the brakes, the train decelerates and you fling forwards into the restraint. And finally, lateral G-forces act from side to side. Some roller coasters feature tight hairpin turns that drastically push you to the side. These g-forces are less comfortable for the human body to experience, causing designers of roller coasters to reduce their effect. Each type of force affects the human body differently. With training and special equipment, humans can be subject to ridiculously high g-forces. Fighter pilots regularly experience 8 g's for example. Fortunately for you, roller coaster designers understand that not everyone is a fighter pilot. Rides are designed for the masses, and their g-forces are limited to what the average person can endure. The human body can deal with a surprising amount of g-force for short durations of time. Our tolerance quickly declines with duration, however. This means that a high amount of g-force for a short duration of time could feel less intense than a smaller amount over a longer period. On top of this, the transition between types of g-force can also impact a ride's intensity. A quick transition to large amounts of g's would feel stronger than a gradual increase over a prolonged period. 
With all of this in mind, various authorities around the world have placed limits on the amount of G-Force roller coasters can feature. Rides in the USA are bound by the American Society for Testing and Materials, the ASTM, while roller coasters in Europe adhere to the European Committee for Standardization, the CEN. Both of these authorities place the following similar, if not identical, limits on the amount of G-Force roller coasters can subject you to in all six directions. The most common G-Forces found on roller coasters, positive and negative G-Forces, feature distinctively different limits. Positive G-Forces, which cause a sensation of being pressed into your seat, are limited to a maximum of 6 Gs for no longer than 1 second. This decreases to 4 Gs by 2 seconds, 3 Gs by 5 seconds, and 2 Gs after 12 seconds. Interestingly, the world's most intense roller coaster features an incredible 6.3 Gs, which according to the limits, can't be experienced for longer than 0.2 seconds. Roller coasters with extreme amounts of positive Gs may cause you to grey out. During this phenomenon, the body finds it difficult to pump blood up to the head. This leads to your field of view shrinking and becoming excessively grey. If you're subject to a grey out over an extended period of time, you may black out or become unconscious, known as G-lock, G-force induced loss of consciousness. Fortunately, once the G-forces have been removed, you'll regain consciousness and normal vision with no damage done to the body. Negative G-forces, responsible for the sensation of being lifted out of your seat, feature much lower limits than positive G-forces. These quickly fall from negative 2G after 0.2 seconds to negative 1.5Gs for up to 4 seconds, before decreasing to negative 1.1Gs after 7 seconds. For context, the first airtime hill on Condor or Wallaby Belgium subjects riders to roughly minus 1Gs for about a second, before decreasing to 0Gs for a further second. Sadly, I don't think there's a roller coaster in the world that has a hill big enough to reach this 7 second limit. Rides with excessive negative Gs may cause your body to struggle to pump blood away from the brain, known as a red out. A red out is potentially dangerous. As a result, strict lower force limits are placed on negative Gs to make red outs impossible on roller coasters. Linear G-forces feature similar limits to positive and negative G-forces. G-forces which cause you to be pinned backwards into your seat during a launch for example can reach a maximum of 6 Gs for up to 1 second, 4 Gs for up to 4 seconds, 3 Gs for up to 11.8 seconds, and then 2.5 Gs onwards. The launch of Blue Fire at Europa Park in Germany causes you to feel approximately 1G for about a second before slowly decreasing back to 0G. The limits to linear G-forces in the opposite direction, when a train hits the brakes for example, depends on the type of restraint used to secure you into the train. A heavy brake will cause you to fling forwards, which may be more comfortable with a more restrictive over-the-shoulder restraint compared to a small lap bar. Beyond 0.5 seconds, lap bar restraints are limited to negative 1.5 Gs, whilst over-the-shoulder restraints are limited to negative 2 Gs. Roller coasters which place you in a prone position have higher limits, up to negative 3.5 Gs, as they better support the body during braking. The final brakes on Anubis the Rider Plopsaland de Pan in Belgium subject you to just over negative 1 G worth of deceleration. Lateral G-forces, which throw you from side to side, are uncomfortable for prolonged periods. As a result, both directions are limited to 3 Gs, which begins to fall towards 2 Gs after 1 second. The hairpin turns on Matterhorn Blitz at Europa Park in Germany feature 1G corners, pinning you to the side of the train. Theoretically, in all six directions, roller coasters have no G-force limits for Gs sustained for less than 0.2 seconds. Despite this, on a technical basis, a ride's maximum G-force will be limited by other factors and are unlikely to fall too far outside of the peak G-force limits. All of these limits are designed to ensure the average person can ride roller coasters comfortably and safely. Manufacturers of roller coasters will often add additional margins to the limits to make the rides even more suited to the average theme park goer. Although, that doesn't mean they can't pack a punch. Intimidator 305, a 305 foot, 93 meter tall giant at King's Dominion in the United States, became infamous for its incredibly intense turn right after the huge first drop. Upon opening in 2010, riders quickly reported greying out during the long corner, with some even saying they blacked out completely. This was despite the ride being designed well within the confines of the G-Force limits. 
Intimidator 305's manufacturer, Intamin, went on to adjust the turn to reduce its intensity and solve the issue. Nevertheless, the ride continues to cause greyouts even to this day. Throughout the designing process, the limits set out by the ASTM and the CEN are at the forefront of roller coaster designers' minds. They want to ensure their rides are enjoyable and ultimately safe. However, there's a lot more to designing roller coasters than just their intensity. The amount of stress placed on the ride's track and trains, where the supports will be placed to deal with this stress, and obstacles in the ride's general area must all be considered. And on top of this, the g-force exerted on a roller coaster changes depending on where you sit in the ride vehicle. Roller coasters with longer trains create more variance in g-force across the ride vehicle compared to shorter ones. Take a traditional roller coaster drop for example. The front of a long train slowly navigates the top of the drop while the rest of the train climbs the lift hill. As the train begins to fall, it builds up speed, causing the back of the train to be pulled over the top of the drop. On Silver Star at Europa Park in Germany, the front of the train peaks at 0.12 Gs throughout the first drop, close to near weightlessness. This decreases to negative 0.05 Gs for the middle seats and negative 0.29 Gs for the back seats. We've produced a whole video which explains this weird quirk in more detail. Essentially, the shorter the train, the more similar the ride experience will be, regardless of seating position. So, with all this in mind, how do designers get it right? Well, fortunately, they have specialized software to calculate the g-forces experienced on a ride in different positions within the train. Unwanted g-forces, ones which could lie outside of the limits, can be removed via small adjustments to the track. For some elements, these g-forces may occur at the front of the train, while for other elements, they may occur at the back. Today, specialized software can also create the perfect ride experience. Force Vector Design flips the process of designing a roller coaster on its head. Instead of designing the track and seeing the resulting g-forces, the g-forces are designed first, which the software then converts into a layout. This removes unnecessary jolts to create smooth transitions between elements, resulting in a perfectly flowing ride. This type of ride design can be found on some of the newer rides built by Vekoma, like Lech Coaster at Legendia in Poland. Although rides without force vector design may feature greater variations in acceleration, sometimes this can make them more thrilling, as manual design allows for snappier transitions between elements. So, the ride has been designed and the track fabricated. What happens next? Once it's transported to and built at the theme park in question, the new roller coaster is tested. How? With test dummies. Accelerometers, small instruments that measure acceleration, are placed on various locations of the train to record the amount of g-force experienced during the ride. The placement of the accelerometers on the trains is critical. According to European standards, they have to be placed 120 centimeters above the seat and 10 centimeters in front of the backrest, roughly corresponding to the position of riders' hearts. Unfortunately for those testing roller coasters, speed, and thus accelerations, aren't always as consistent as you might think. Several conditions can change a ride's speed, including weather, the number of times the roller coaster has already run, and how full the ride's train is. Additional dummies are used to simulate extra weight within the train, helping the roller coaster to maintain its speed throughout the entire layout. On top of this, rides must have at least three test runs before their g-forces can be measured to maintain consistency between measurements. The readings gained from the accelerometers are highly detailed, but often include unwanted noise or vibrations. These are removed with help from computer software, resulting in a clear indication of a roller coaster's g-forces throughout the entire ride. The ultimate results are these. The graphical visualizations of G-Force you've already been seeing appear throughout this video. They're a fantastic way to visualize the strength and length of G-Forces across the six directions of motion. They're also incredibly useful for determining whether or not a ride breaks the G-Force limits. The exact G-Force breakdowns of roller coasters aren't anywhere near as common as the maximum G-Force figure many theme parks already advertise. Fortunately, there's a group of people going around recording the g-forces of roller coasters to a level of accuracy which often matches the official organizations. Coaster stats are currently traveling to theme parks and correctly attaching their accelerometers to roller coasters to demonstrate the huge range of g-forces that can be experienced on rides. 
All of the visualizations in this video have been captured by the Coaster Stats team, and these are just some of the many rides already documented. If you'd like to see how intense your favorite ride is, check them out by clicking the i button or heading to the link in the description. So there you go. Despite roller coasters getting taller and faster, they're never going to be too much. Rides are designed for the masses, not fighter pilots. The G-Force limits put in place by authorities such as the ASTM and the CEN are there to keep you safe. Though, it's up to roller coaster designers to continue to make rides more fun than ever. Thank you for watching, and a huge thanks goes to Coaster Stats for helping to make this video.